All right. Welcome, everybody, to The Long Arming by Jacqueline, Beginner Quilting Bee. This is week two. So last week, we just went over kind of a kickoff and a shopping list to make sure everybody was ready for this week. Um, and this week, we actually start sewing. So this is block creation. And I just have the same quote up there, finished is better than perfect, which is um, Jenny Doan from Missouri Star Quilt Company. Um, that is a reminder that we're here to learn, we're here to get better, and we're all going to make something beautiful. So don't beat yourself up. You're mastering a new skill. It's going to be great. Whatever you make, it'll be beautiful. So um, a couple of stitching basics. We have got a lot of different people at different levels in this class, so we're going to slow it down and back it up for those people who are newer. So if you're more experienced, just hang in there. Um, you're ahead of the game. You can rest on your laurels a little bit. Um, so we're going to always, when we're sewing, place the right sides of the fabrics together. And so if we can look in my camera here, this fabric has like a pretty side and an ugly side. This is a solid fabric. It's the same on both sides. So you just got to pick one side to be the right and the wrong side. But when we go to sew, you're always going to put your pretty side and your pretty side facing together. And then after you sew, when you open it up, both of your pretty sides will be facing the same direction. So you always want to make sure you're doing right sides together as you're stitching. And you want to align carefully. So if my fabrics are wonky and all whopper dod when I go to put them under the machine, they're not going to magically get better just because I'm sewing. So when you go to align, you're going to very carefully take that edge. And you took some care cutting it and making it the right shape and size. So when you sew it, you want to align those edges. Be fussy. Get them just how you want them before you sew. And my little mantra is align, pinch, and sew. I know last week we kind of touched on finger pinning. So if I take my time to align this, and I don't want to hold on to that while I'm doing other things like operating my machine, I can take some pins and put in here. And usually if I'm sewing... See if I can see that. If I'm sewing this way, I want to pin this way. And you'll pull those out as your machine approaches because if your needle hits that pin, it can send things flying. It's not fun. It can break your needle. Needles are too expensive to be breaking them. If you're not so much a pinner with metal pinners, you're going to be a pinner with your fingers and finger pins. So you will align the edges, pinch, to create a pin out of your fingers and then sew. And you might sew three inches and then come back and do another round. You'll do another align, another pinch, another sew. So how do you eat an elephant one stitch at a time? You can pause and do another align, pinch, sew 25 times if you want to. Um, next one, take your time. This is a labor of love. If you're in a huge hurry, you can always go to Walmart and buy a blanket. We're doing this because we care, and so you can put great care into your product. It's not a race. He who quilts the fastest doesn't win. So take your time. Don't get stressed out. Don't let the machine get you in a hurry. Um, next one, the seam ripper. Oops, where am I? There's my camera. Everyone uses the seam ripper. It's part of sewing at every level. Don't be embarrassed to pull this out. It's not because you're a beginner. It's because you care about what you're doing. So have your seam ripper handy. It's just like your eraser. And then last but not least, some of you have done garment sewing where you backstitch. So let's pop this in here. I'm going to use the edge of my press... Um, Press your foot here as my guide. Oops, helps if I get out of the menu. Ta -da. So I've done my aligning. 
the two layers of fabric are exactly lined up. I'm pinching and using my hands as pins to hold that alignment just where I want it. And then I'm going to sew. If I were sewing a garment, I would want to backstitch. So you might have a lever off to the right that you push down and then push your pedal. Or if you have a computerized machine, you'll probably have a button and go backwards. Usually in quilting, anytime I make a seam, I'm going to come along later and make another seam that goes across that and locks that. So in garment sewing, you always backstitch to lock in your beginning stitches and you backstitch at the end. In quilting, it's kind of optional. The only exception would be if I were sewing along and in the middle of nowhere, I lost my thread. Um, when you start over, you'll want to overlap by a little bit, half an inch, and do a little backstitch to kind of tie in those loose ends where you started and stopped. So if you're sort of in the middle of nowhere, you can do a little backstitch. So on my machine, I don't know if you can see this little button. I have got, oh, the foot of my tripod is hung up. I've got this little reverse button that looks like an arrow turning around and going backwards. If you have a mechanical machine, on the right-hand side over here, you'll have a little lever that you push down, and then when you push the gas pedal, that'll make you go in reverse. All right, that was a lot. Especially if you are new, does anyone have any questions? Is this confusing anyone? Are we already asleep? <laughs> Marquita's been waiting for entrance. I didn't see her on the other window. Hey, Marquita. Are you there? Well, oh, now I don't hear her. There she is. Hey, Marquita, how are you? Well, I can see you, but I don't hear you. I don't know if you have your mic turned on. Okay, my mic's on. Hey. Hey. Um, we've only done one side. You were um, requesting entrance, and I didn't see it on the other tab. So um, we're going to go over really okay. quick what we just did, because um, okay. I know you're new to your sewing machine. Yes. So um, all you missed, here, let me go back. All you missed was the little title slide. So um, we're just hitting stitching basics. So when you sew, I don't know if you can see in the little video, this top fabric has a pretty side and then a yucky side. And they call the pretty side the right side, as in right and wrong. And then this piece of fabric, it's a solid. It's the same on both sides. So you just pick one side to be the right side, and it's either one. They're both the same. So whenever we sew, we're going to put the pretty sides of our fabric together and sew. And then when you open up, you've got both pretty sides facing the same direction. So you're always going to place your fabrics right sides together. And then we talked a little bit about aligning. So your fabric is cut to the right size. And if you cut it yourself, you took a lot of time to do that. So you want to make sure you take your time and carefully align those edges and be fussy about it. Because if you don't get it aligned before you put it under the machine, it's not going to magically line itself up underneath the needle. So you want it exactly how you want it. And then when it goes under the machine, you can use your hands to hold it exactly how you want it. So take your time and be a little bit fussy when you're lining up your fabrics. Um, the fastest way to get a blanket is to roll on down to Walmart and buy one. But we're doing this because we care. So you're putting a lot of care into the cutting, the picking of the fabrics. Um, don't be afraid to take time and care in your sewing. It's not a race. Everybody thinks that somehow if you sew faster, that means you're like a better sewist. Throw that out the door. Um, take as much time as you want. You're here to enjoy the process. Um, and we talked about Mr. Seam Ripper. Nobody should be embarrassed about using the Seam Ripper. 
This is every SOAS at every level's best friend. Um, and then we talked a little bit about back stitching. So for people who are used to sewing garments, they always will sew a little forward and then a little bit backwards. Um, my machine has this button. Did I lose video? No, I didn't. Um, my machine has this little reverse button. If you have a, um, the arrow kind of turns around and goes backwards. If you have a mechanical machine, then over here on the right, you'll typically have like a lever that you push down and then you push the gas pedal and that will make the machine sew backwards. So when you sew a garment, you always do a little back stitch, like two or three stitches at the beginning of your seam and at the end of your seam to lock it in. In quilting, that's normally optional because normally whenever I sew a seam, I'm going to sew another seam across it. So you can get away without back stitching. You don't have to worry about that. The only exception would be if you're sewing along in the middle of a seam and you run out of thread or your thread breaks and you stop sort of in the middle of nowhere. When you start up again, you'll overlap your stitching about half an inch with what you did before. Do a little back stitch, like two stitches forward, two stitches back, and then go forward. And that'll kind of tie in and lock in those loose ends that you had for that sort of unexpected stop. But normally, back stitching is optional in quilting. Where is my little folder? Ah, I lost my tab. My sharing tab got lost. Here it is. Here it is. All right. So, did we have any questions? All right. Um, let's talk about seam allowance. So, when you stitch, there's always this little space. Let me cut my thread. Pull this puppy out of here. So when you stitch, you've got your line where your stitches are and then the edge of your fabric. So the space between where your stitches are going and the edge of your fabric is called your seam allowance. In quilting, traditionally, a quarter inch is used. And if you download a pattern off of the internet and you're trying to follow along, some patterns are really sensitive to that seam allowance. And if it's not just right, everything's going to come out a little bit weird. This pattern that we're doing is very forgiving and you'll be fine. So um, if you have a quarter inch seam, um, a quarter inch guide foot, or a nice quarter inch guide on your needle plate down here to follow, you can do that. But for what we're doing, you can use the edge of your presser foot. So when you align your fabrics and you put them under your presser foot and you lower it down. So mine has a button. Um, mechanical machines are going to have a lever back here. So this is the needle bar. Back here is the lever that will lift up and lower your presser foot. If you want to use the edge of your foot and align this edge of the two fabrics that you made nice and neat and feed that under and go right along the edge of this foot, that will be perfectly fine for what we're doing today and for the rest of this quilt. That's usually about three eighths. If you happen to have a quarter inch guide foot and you want to use it, fantastic. Um, this pattern is very forgiving. You don't have to be stressed out about it. So anything that's consistent and neat and gives you a nice straight line, that's what you want to use. Oh, look, I led into my own segue. Consistent is better than perfect. So instead of weaving around trying to find a quarter of an inch, if following the edge of your presser foot gives you a nice, straight, clean stitch line, nice and smooth, consistent, all the way down your seam, do what makes you comfortable. Um, and then, for some reason, I put pressing in here. So let's pivot this camera around. Let's see. Can you see my iron? Not quite. 
All right. So when you press, especially if you have a super light fabric and a super dark fabric, you want to press toward the darkest fabric. So in this case, this orange guy is my darker fabric. So if I am going to press, I'm going to hold the darker fabric up, take my iron, and get all this other junk out of the road, and I'm going to slide it over. So what that does is it takes my seam allowance and it folds it over underneath the darker fabric. So that does a couple of things. When your two seam allowances go the same direction, it's a little bit of a stronger seam. But also, if this were white, this lighter one, and I took this bright orange color and I put it underneath, you can actually kind of see that through. So generally, if you press your seam allowances both together toward the darker fabric, that's going to give you the nicest finish. So you put your lighter fabric down that you just sewed, put your iron on it, you're holding up the darker fabric, and you're going to roll that seam toward the dark one. This iron is off. I'm going to go ahead and heat it up. If you bought the kit, all of your fabrics are 100% cotton. And my advice to you would be put your iron on the hottest dry setting. And you can see my iron says dry right on there. And if you want to use steam, I use my little trick. I have my little spray bottle with my water separately because I don't trust any iron to stay clean and not leak and not get rusty little drippy doos in there. If you love your steam iron, I won't judge you. Do what you want to do. You can use the steam setting on your iron. Um, but if you're using 100% cotton, it's much faster to crank up the heat on that iron. If you're using a fabric that has um, sparkly inks on there, if you're using a t-shirt that has um, screen printing on there, if you're using a synthetic fabric, you're going to have to base your iron setting on what your fabric is. If you have like, polyester, and you use the hottest setting on there, you're going to melt your fabric. <laughs> so, but if you're using the kit, that's all 100% cotton. Most quilting fabrics are 100% cotton. And if that's what you're using, go ahead and crank that iron up because you'll be a lot faster. And remember, you're not pressing because the quilt police are going to come and haul you away if you don't press. You're pressing because it's going to make your job easier when it comes to sew and cut, and it's going to give you a nice, tidy result that looks like all the effort you put into it. All right, questions? We're going to try to get straight to the sewing. So we're just running through some basics. All right. So we touched on this a little bit in the first one, in the first week. We're doing our center out construction. Let me make sure you can see my sewing machine. I'll put you up here. That's pretty good. Does anybody not have their fabric? Everybody's got sewing machine and fabric because we're going to sew. Okay. So mine is just a sample, and I'm going to use this cream colored rectangle as my center. And I am going to use these orange strips and beige strips that I have to represent my light and dark. And we're going to sew together. I'm just going to get rid of that sample seam. So I'm going to start with my dark color. I'm going to take my center square. And remember, we said a line, pinch, and sew. You'll notice I'm leaving a little bit of my strip sticking out here. Give yourself a little bit of grace. If I align perfectly and my seam isn't exactly straight or this cut at the end of my strip isn't exactly straight, when I open up, this could be a little bit off. And then I, I've lost a little bit. So what I'm going to do is put my strip down, put my center square on top, I'm going to carefully align these edges, and I'm going to give myself a little grace here, a little buffer. Slide that under, 
lower your presser foot. The other thing that that does is it gives my needle a place to go. Because sometimes the sewing machine wants to get tangled up if it's right there on the, off the edge of the fabric. If you have a mechanical machine, this is where you're going to take your tails from your bobbin, which is the underneath thread, and your top thread or needle thread, it'll be called, and you'll hold those over here. Pinch them for one or two stitches. So I'm going to lower my needle in there. If you have a mechanical machine, that wheel on the right-hand side, I have one too, you can lower your needle down with that. If you have a computerized machine, you can just push the needle down button. So I'm going to align my edges, be real fussy. I'm going to pinch it. If I let go, the fabric's going wherever. So hold on. And I'm going to feed that in. And I'm watching this edge of my presser foot. And as the fabric goes under, I can pivot it to make sure I'm guiding it right along the edge of that presser foot. If you want to use your quarter inch foot, use your quarter inch foot. If you don't have one, just use the edge of the foot you've got. All right, so I'm stitched all the way, one stitch off of that center square. And my machine has a thread cutter button and a press your foot lift button. If you don't have that, you've got this lever back here. You'll um, turn your hand wheel so your needle is up. You'll lift this lever back here to lift up your foot. And when you pull yours out, you'll have two threads. And you might have a cutter. My cutter is here. Sometimes it's right behind the needle bar here. And you'll take those threads, leave yourself a tail from the machine, and cut off close to the fabric, if that makes sense. So there's our first seam. And put the pretty sides together so when I open up, they're both facing the same direction. And then what I want to do here is press. And my iron should be hot now. Let me see if you guys can see that. Pretty good. So I put my lighter fabric down. Let's move that iron. I put my lighter fabric down. I'm going to hold the darker fabric. And I'm going to roll the seam and press. Now, you don't need a scrub. This iron is plenty hot. You just roll the seam open. The iron will do the work. It's heavy enough. And lift off. You don't need to scrub. That can sometimes like warp the edges of your fabric. So plus that's like way too much work. Okay. So there's our first seam. And I have a little bit of grace up here if my seam wasn't perfectly straight. And then I have this big long tail down here. So then I'll come over to my cutting station. Get used to this motion. You're going to do it more than once. And if you're using scissors, you line up your scissors and snip that off. If you're using the rotary cutter, you take your rotary cutter. And I'm going to line up with the edge of my center square and trim it off. And then I have a nice straight edge. And this is where I'm going to sew next. So my seam allowance is folded toward the darker fabric. And I got a nice straight sewing edge. And if you want to come and clean this up, you can. See how this is like not straight? If I had gone right on the edge, I would have kind of messed up there. So give yourself a little forgiveness. And I'm going to cut mine off a little shorter because my rectangle was not square to begin with. So I'm going to make it square. You won't be cutting off that much. But I just grabbed a scrap to represent my center square. So now I've got these. They kind of look alike. These are going to be just about the exact same size. So this was my center. That's in the slides, number one, that red square. And then this is number two. He's about the same size. So then I'm going to take my next fabric. So I'm doing my darks. I'm going on to the darks. And then I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to lay the strip down, get closer, 
And the reason I'm doing that is because over here I've got these seam allowance flappies and I want to be able to see what's going on with these. And I'm going to take my nice neat edge that I just made and I'm going to do the exact same thing. Give myself a little grace at the top there just in case I'm not perfect because guess what? I'm not. I'm going to lower my presser foot. Stick my needle in there. And I'm going to do very carefully a line pinch sew. So right now my seam allowance is facing up toward the machine. So as I get there, I'm just going to make sure that little seam allowance is going the right direction as it goes under my foot. Take your time. Right along the edge. I'm guiding that fabric so he's right even with the edge of my presser foot. All right, and then you break that thread, lift up your machine, and voila, second piece. And then it's a lot of repetition from there. <laughs> All right, so you guys go. Everybody grab a center square and sew it on, and we'll see how we go. I'm going to go ahead and press mine. And I'm pressing toward the darker fabric. And then I'm going to take this guy and trim him. This was my little bit of grace over here that I gave myself just in case I'm not perfect. And then on this end, um, you'll notice that I iron first. I go to the pressing station first. Let's bring you over so you can actually see. And then I cut. Because if this seam isn't perfectly straight, which they never are, and if this isn't perfectly aligned, if I leave it closed and I cut it off and open it up, this could be at a little angle, and then I've kind of lost my corner. So press them first using either your scissors or your rotary cutter. Trim him off flush. There we go. Looks like I need to put a new blade on that rotor cutter. And then you should have a piece that looks about like this. So I've got my center, which in your slides is block one, block two, block three. And I'm starting to form that spiral. All right, you guys want to go ahead and start your first block? You can use your video if you have problems. You can show me what's going on. We can try to help you. And if you're not having problems, you can show me what you got. I'm going to give you a minute to do that. Oh, Christine's holding hers up. I think you're a little ahead of the game. <laughs> You can take, put your um, microphone on and tell us a little bit about your block while everybody's sewing. It's like skulls and flowers and stuff and things. Stuff and things. Show it, um, show it again so people can look at it. All right. Oh. So go. Christine has seen this before. For those of you who are like, how did she know? She's psychic. She's seen this before. But she's doing a little variation. Her center square is a little bit bigger, so you can see her pattern because she's got her skull in there. So for future reference, if you're doing this down the line on another quilt, if you put a really big square in the middle of this, you can either, let's say you've got a fabric with a bunch of flowers that you like, you can kind of cut a square around that flower so you get like a nicely framed flower in the middle. Um, they have that fabric that you can print on in your printer. You could print out a picture of your best friend's face and put it in the middle of your block. So for future quilts, because you're going to do variations on this 900 times because you're going to love it so much, um, you can play with that center square and put a fancy little motif that you picked out of your fabric or something special in there. And the rest of the block kind of makes a frame around it. Christine's best friend is a skull. <laughs> I like spooky right. things. Spooky. I like it too. 
right, Nicole, I know you sewed ahead. What are you doing? Everybody's got their video off. Don't be afraid. <laughs> How All right, so I'm good. Um, I've been like wrangling with the kids. That's why my camera's been off. <laughs> That's fine. Um, I figured that people don't need to be distracted by me doing that. Um, so I started ahead, and the only reason I did that was because our material is so um, eclectic. <laughs> and that's a nice way to put it. But these are like old scraps from, um, I think a couple of these is from like um, Natalie, which is Christine's middle kid. Like that's mm -hmm. from like outfits for her. There's uh, one of the materials is an outfit for Abigail. So, and then one of these sheets was um, my sheet dorm from sheet. my dorm back in 2006. Yay! So like See, that's that has a meaning. All those fabrics have like, a heritage somewhere. Yeah, <laughs> but that's what a square looks like. I love it. I love it. Yeah. So, and then uh, mom is just doing the opposite of me. So. <laughs> the opposite. She's doing um, the same fabrics, but switching the background and the star. Yeah, so uh, so mine, the way that I started mine, instead of starting with the lights, I started with the darks. So then, so mine will have the dark um, background and the light star, and then mom's will have the um, the dark star with the light background. Very good. So Very she, good. she told me she couldn't cheat off of me. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, now, Marquita, I know you were having some sewing machine issues. Did you get going with your sewing machine? Um, I I haven't yet. I'm going to have to go back through and review everything. My baby's cutting four new teeth, so she's been kind of see. So I've been in between. Like today, when I when I text you, I was trying to in between, and then she <laughs> woke back up, and she's just been kind of fussy with this teething here. Yep, real life happens. That's why we record these. You can really do it at your own pace when it suits your time schedule and your, your real life. All right, well, let's proceed. Um, and if you need a lot of help tomorrow, Marquita, you call me and we'll figure something out. Okay, thank you. All right, so um, I'm doing my center out construction. This was block one. This was block two. They look alike, so you kind of have to... And then... Um, now I've got a long one, so I can kind of tell where I am. That's plot three. So I've done my center, my dark, my dark. It doesn't matter which color you start with as long as you stay within your groups. So now I've got this um, sort of beige color. It's going to be my light. I didn't pick these colors out because they are pretty. I picked them out because – oh, I'm tangled up in my machine. I picked them out because they're scraps that I have. See, this is what happens when you try to drink tea during a class. It gets in the way of your camera. All right, so I did center. Dun, dun. I'm going around this way. Now I'm going to do this one. So you want to lay your strip down and put your piece on top. I'm giving myself a little bit of grace. If you're confident and you know that your seam is exactly perpendicular and that this cut is exactly parallel, and you don't want to give yourself grace, be confident. But if you are not, it's um, better safe than sorry. I'm going to put my needle in, and my seam allowance is going up toward the needle again, so I'm going to have to watch that out. So these seams are getting longer and longer, so I'm really worried about what's right in front of the needle. I'm not looking right at the needle because that's too late. Um, imagine trying to drive your car, cut a hole in the floor of your car and look straight down at the road and then try to drive looking straight down at the road. So just like that's ridiculous, you don't want to look where you're at. You want to look where you're going, which is out here. Now, way down, I don't want to get distracted by that either. That's like, all right, I'm driving to Chicago and I'm trying to look at street cameras in Chicago, but I'm still in Dallas. So don't look too far ahead because you'll get yourself confused, but don't look right under your feet either. You want to look out ahead where you're going. So I'm going to align nicely 
I'm going to pinch. This is my finger pin. I'm holding the two pieces of fabric in alignment, and I can steer them if I start to get off track. This hand, I'm going to push my seam allowance up so it feeds nicely under that presser foot. Take your time. Put your presser foot right along the edge of that fabric. If you want to stop and do a line pinch sew again, um, it's better to do it more often than to try to guess. And there I go. So now it gets pretty repetitive. You're going to repeat the same process throughout your block. You're going to repeat the same process from block to block. All right, so I will press. This is a little bit, um, I've got a dark fabric and a light fabric. So to make it easy, I'm going to put my block down and I'm going to iron the strip away. And I'll show you why. I've got a seam allowance and I've got another seam allowance right here. And this is going to make it kind of stiff and it's going to want to go that way. So I'm just going to iron it the way it wants to go. It's easier to bend the single piece of fabric than all these layers of fabric. So you might as well go with the flow and go the way that makes the fabric happy. So once you get going, you can put your iron on your block and roll the flap out. And your seam allowance will always go out to the new flap that you put on. And then after I press, so I know how this fabric's gonna lay. Why don't I turn my camera the right way? I can take my scissors or my rotary cutter when you go to line this up, it's helpful to um, give yourself a running start. So I'm not lining up the edge of my ruler with a small amount of fabric there. Let me bring this up. I'm going to, well, that's not helpful either. I'm going to line my ruler up with as much of this straight line as possible. So I know when I go to cut this, it's exactly in line with that. If you're not using the rotary cutter, what you'll do is take your pen and put your pen this way against your ruler and make a line and come back with your scissors and cut. So this is doable with scissors as well. My rotary cutter, it's easier to demonstrate what we're doing. I'm cutting my tail off. So if your iron is not handy and close like mine is, and you don't want to make a trip every time, it is possible to do what's called finger pressing. So I would take my flap and I would hold it open and I would take my fingernail. They even make little wood roly-poly things that you can roll with. And I'm going to scrape with my fingernail. And that is kind of like a quick and dirty press. You can just kind of and move on. It's faster. It's not quite as neat. It's not going to give you quite as precise a finish. But if that's what you'll do, and you're not going to get up and go to the iron every time, and you can't build yourself a little nest where it's all close, it's better than nothing. Do what you'll do. <laughs> so if finger pressing is the most we can get out of you, finger press. If you um, want it to be super precise and you want to press the seam with your iron every time, do that. It's a little bit nicer. It does take a little bit longer. So um, you decide what's more important to you and your quilt. So now I've got, according to our slide, I've got number one, number two, number three, number four. And if I'm trying to figure out where I'm going, I can count from the middle. So I started on my dark group. So I'm going center block, dark, dark, light, light. I know my light one goes here. Once I get to this point, you'll also notice that one of these sides has two seams pointing toward it. So this side just has one seam. This side just has one seam, but this side has two seams pointing over here. And that, those two seams point where you're going. So I'm gonna take my new strip and wherever those two seams are pointing, that's where my newest strip is gonna go. That's kind of a little pro tip. So if you get lost and you just wanna pick up a block and say, oh, where's the next seam go? You know it's over here. So it doesn't matter if you start with your lights or your darks, but you're going to keep them in the same group. 
So my darks are here. I'm going dark, dark, light, light. And then after I do light, light, I'm going to start again. I'm going to go dark, dark, light, light, dark, dark, light, light. And you just keep on going. So if the two seams trick works for you, do that. If counting from the accent and spiraling out and seeing who's next works for you, you do that. More than one way to um, get where you're going. All right. So I'm going to put the strip on. Ta-da! All right, so I'm breaking my own rules. I want the strip down, and I want the block up, because I want to see where these seam allowances are, and I want to know what they're doing when I go to run over them. Also, this little edge at the, so this metal thing is the needle plate, and there's always a little gap under there. You'll notice I have tape on mine, because I don't want my seam allowance to go under there and grab and get hung up, and it just annoys me. So I put a little painter's tape to make a little sh on ramp. That's optional. That's another reason to have your seam allowances face up toward you. You can align real carefully. You can see what's going on, and you don't have to worry about this little tab of fabric getting stuck in your needle plate. So I'm going to align. Be real fussy. I'm going to follow the edge of my presser foot or my quarter-inch guide or my quarter-inch guide foot, whatever you have. Make sure that I feed that seam allowance in. He's going toward the needle, so i got to make sure he lays down flat as I go over. So when I am here, I can hold the fabric and maneuver it, pivot it, to steer him toward the needle with both hands. Once I get down toward the end, it gets a little bit harder. So I have to make sure that I'm using my left hand. Because once I get to about here, I'm running into the foot. So I got to take my right hand away. But my left hand can guide that fabric through. If you lift your hands up and push the gas pedal, and run it through there and hope for the best, what you're going to end up with is a beak. You're either going to veer off toward the edge of the fabric, and when you open it up, it'll curve out, and you'll have a little extra fabric there, or it'll curve in, and you'll have a little pinch. But either way, if you get scared, you take your hands off and let it run off. Um, when you go to open your seam up, you'll have like this nice straight line, and right at the end, it'll go whoop one way or the other. And then when you go to press it, you'll either have like a little weird tuck there or your piece won't press flat. So that's the goal is a nice, straight, tidy, consistent seam all the way from one side of the fabric all the way off to the end without a little beak or a little hip at the end there. All right, so let's go ahead and press this one. And I'm not going to do a whole block because I don't think anybody wants to watch me slowly So. So because I've got all these seam allowances, I'm going to put my iron on my block. I'm holding up my new flap, and I'm going to roll the flap open. And I don't need to scrub the weight of my iron, and the heat of the iron is plenty. Oop, I got a little thread. We'll ignore it. And this is how my block is coming. And I can see where I'm going next by counting. There's my center square. There's square two three, four, five. If I keep going in the same direction, it tells me I'm going to add my next piece here. Or if I look at my two seams, they're pointing down. So that also tells me this is where my next one is going to go. And what color is it going to be? Well, my light group is starting to form on this corner. If I'm sewing a piece on here, I'm sewing him into the dark group. So I would take another dark fabric, and I'm just using scraps to demonstrate. This is a little bit of a weird color scheme, but I just grabbed what I had. So I know because this fabric that I'm sewing to is dark, that I'm going to be adding another from my dark group. All right. So that's our little demo. And you guys know you can use this class time to sew. You don't have to just um, stare at me. <laughs> I know I'm not that interesting. So feel free to sew along. Feel free to show what you're doing and ask your questions.
All right, so let's look at the slide. I mean, we did the demo, but we might as well read the slide. Um, you start with your two and a half inch center square. You saw from Christine's that once you do this once, you can play with that center square and do weird things in there, whatever you want to do. Um, it is going to be a lot trickier for you to try to figure out how long each of those strips are and pre-cut them. So what I recommend is you sew your block to a strip, press, and then trim the strip off at the end. Rather than cut a bunch of pieces and try to say, oh, if this is two and a half, then the next one is two and a half, then the next one is four and a half, then the next one is, uh, and then I got to subtract my seam allowance, and da, 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 da. And then if anything is a little bit off in your math or in your cutting, then now your piece isn't the same, the right size. So just sew it on first and cut it off to the size that your block is. So if your seam allowance was a little wonky, if it wasn't exactly a quarter of an inch, if your strip width, if you cut your own strips and they're not perfectly two and a half every single one, it doesn't matter. Whatever it ends up being, cut it to length. So you don't have to measure. That's why I love this pattern. No measuring. You don't have to hope it comes out perfect. You don't have to hope you're perfect and that it all works out. You just cut it off wherever it is. It'll be fine. Okay. So in my little slide example, I started with the background color. In all fairness, start with whatever color you want. But you want to keep your groups together. So you're starting to accumulate all your lights on one corner and all your darks on the other corner, or whatever your two groups were. And then, uh, you've just done one lap. Yay, which is what we did here. And then you're going to keep going. So this block we started with dark, 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 light, light. I'm going to keep going until I've done three complete laps. So the way you count a lap is from your center, then I'm going to count out one. And if I count from my center the other direction, one. If I count from my center the other direction, one, one. You want to keep going until you can count from your center and go one, two, three in all directions. And you say, why are you saying that? That's so obvious and so repetitive. But you'll get to a block where you're like, it doesn't look quite square. And something is weird. And I can't quite figure it out. And maybe you did three laps on most of it. And you might have like one more, lay, one more side to do. So if you just count out from your center, you can figure out which lap you're on. Trust me, when you've done this a bunch of times, you'll start to get lost and you'll start to look for those guide posts to make it simpler. Um, and we talked about the two seams pointing where I'm going next. So in this example, I've got one seam pointing that way, one seam pointing that way, but on this one, two seams. So I know I'm coming down here. This side that I just did has no seams. So don't sew on top of that. All right, and then I only have two light fabrics and two dark fabrics. So if I were to go again, I'd have to go with this same one. But you want to mix yours up and give it a nice scrappy texture. So try to get some variation, and maybe you make your roll. I'm going to try not to sew the same fabric. So I'm adding to the dark group. If I had enough fabric with my demo, I would say not this one, not this one. Pick a third different fabric and sew it on there. And then when I go to this side, I might say, okay, not this fabric, not this fabric. I'll pick a third fabric from my dark group to sew on there. And that will give it a nice kind of random um, look. And all the fabrics in this group will start to make more of a texture. It will be less about each individual fabric and more about what is it that holds them together as a group. So try to mix and match. Honestly, there's no wrong way to do it. So, like if you don't follow that rule, it's not going to break the world. You'll be fine. Okay. Squaring up. So let's pretend that I'm only doing one lap for the sake of demonstration. And I'm going to come over here and make sure you can actually see what I'm doing. Oop. Come on, tripod. Get your leg out. So just for the sake of demonstration, pretend I've gone around three more times. 
You guys don't want to see me do that. And I gave myself a little grace here, mostly because the edge of this was messy. So I'm going to align along the edge of my square. Okay. And pretend that I've got one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three in all directions. So if your strips were perfectly 2.5 inches, and if every single seam allowance is perfectly one quarter inch and perfectly straight, you would end up with a 14 inch block. Since that's probably not going to happen because everybody here is new to sewing or to quilting, and honestly, it doesn't matter that much, um, you're going to have to square. And sometimes your edge will be a little bit warbled in the middle of your block, and you may want to do a little squaring in the middle of your block to give yourself a nice straight edge to sew to. You can actually, I'm going to confuse everybody. You can actually not even use a strip that's parallel and you get these like widening stripes. It's kind of a neat look. So your goal for this quilt is to keep them square. But on your next quilt, try playing with that. Try playing with cutting this not a square. So you'll take your nice long ruler, whatever you're using as your straight edge, and you'll tidy up your edge. So this part here is a little frayed and messy. He sticks out a little further than the rest. So I'm going to use the markings on my ruler and find a nice long seam and line it up. And then you'll either use your pen to mark and your scissors or you'll use your rotary cutter. And I'm going to clean up that edge. And now, whether I did a perfectly straight job or not, this edge, I just made it perfectly straight. So you don't have to be perfect. You just come back with a ruler to make it straight. If you're really inconsistent with your seam allowance and really waving around and um, not very good at lining this up so that it's um, at a little bit of an angle, it'll be okay. You're going to have a beautiful quilt. You're just going to make a straight line, cut it off with your um, rotary cutter or your scissors, and then you've got a beautiful straight edge. Whatever you do in the middle, just make it nice at the end. So I just made this edge perfectly straight. I'm going to come back, use the markings of my ruler. So I know this is straight because I just made it straight. Whatever it was before, it's straight now. And I'm going to line up one of these lines of my ruler. And I'm going to come to this side. And if this was crookedy, if it was warped and wavy, if I have one sticking out a little more than the other one, I can take my rotary cutter and trim that off. Now, not only is this edge nice and perfectly straight, whatever it was before, I just made it straight. But I also know that this edge and this edge are 90 degrees. So this corner is a perfect 90 degree corner because I just made it that way. I didn't have to sew it perfectly because I can come back and make it perfect. That's another reason this pattern is so forgiving. So if you happen to have a square ruler, let me grab my bigger square ruler. This one's big enough. You can keep going around with the same straight edge you used before. So I straightened this edge and I straightened this edge. I can put a line here and straighten this edge and put a line of my ruler here and straighten this edge and work my way around. But what I can also do is, I know this corner is perfect, and I can put him here. Let me turn my ruler the right way. Yeah. Ta -da. And I can come here like this and line him up to two lines, because this ruler is square. And then I can trim two sides at once. 
So that's what makes this square ruler kind of a nice to have. I don't need this, but it gives me fewer cuts. If you have this, it's very nice. And then you can measure up exactly how big your block is. So this sample block ended up being six and a quarter inches. And I know it's six and a quarter inches on all sides. And I know that all these corners are nice 90 degree corners. My recommendation is you don't do hey, this Jonathan. Squaring. I saw Jonathan. Hey. What's up, Lynn? It is Jonathan and Will. Yeah. Um, my recommendation is that you don't do this squaring until the end because you do lose a little bit of fabric. And it's okay if these lines in the middle aren't exactly parallel and aren't exactly 90 degrees. It'll still be beautiful. It'll still be cool. You need to cut your hair, hippie. <laughs> Jonathan's hair is almost as long as mine. I, I represent that statement. <laughs> All right. So have fun. In your um, slide, it says you want your, your block to be close to 14 inches. You don't even care about that. Um, when you're done with your blocks, you're going to find your smallest block. And if it's too small, you can just add a couple more laps. So if this was um, a little bit small, I could go once more around to beef it up and get it up to size. That's OK. But the one, two, three is an idea. If you do that and your seam allowances were a little chunky and maybe you were a little crooked, so when you squared it up, you lost a little fabric and you said, oh, he's a little small, go ahead and add another lap. It's okay. It's no big deal. Um, you're going to find your smallest block. And if he's way too little, add a little bit of fabric, do another lap of strips around. If he's not too small, that's going to set your size. So when you go to trim all of your edges, you're going to trim them so they're all the same size. Exactly what that size is, who cares? If you followed the pattern and you are perfect like a robot, it'll be 14 inches. Nobody's is. So um, if yours is 13 and a half, if yours is 12, if yours is 11, and you're happy with that, that's fine. So you want it to be all the same size. You want it to have tidy, straight edges. And you want it to have right angles in the corners at the end. Hey. Hey, Jason. Posted <laughs> already, and they seem to be okay with it. With Bill is so ready. it doesn't matter if your block is a little bit bigger, a little bit smaller. It doesn't matter if these lines look a little bit like they're spiraling, or these strips look a little bit like wedges. That is going to add some unique artistic character. That's what's going to let somebody know that this was handmade and not mass produced by a big box store. So, but when you go to sew them together. You're going to want them to all be the same size so your strips line up. You're going to want to have nice 90 degree angles and nice straight edges. So whatever size you pick. So if I were going to make them out of my quilt out of this block, this would be six and a quarter. This is still a log cabin. I only did one lap and he's pretty small. But it would work. Okay. Um, your blocks may turn out a little small. This is fine. In the end. Just pick your smallest block and trim them all to the same size. We already said that. Um, if you're going to do a lot of trimming, like say you did some beaking and your block is a little bit rounded or you've got little, little points coming out, your corners might go a little out or a little in. Um, and you're like, I'm not sure where to cut. Use your center as a guide. And when you pick your size, you can look at your ruler and try to put your center accent square in the center of what you're trimming off. So if this were all wonky, I wouldn't want to trim it here because that's going to put my center way to the side and that's going to look a little weird. And I wouldn't want to trim off to the other side either. I'm going to try to place my center square in the middle of the area I'm keeping. And that's just going to, to your eye, good enough is good enough, right? From uh, the back of a moving horse, if it looks like it's give or take in the middle, keep it. That's good. OK. Um, oh, you know what? This 
confused me. That last bullet says diagonal folds help you to line up the cuts. That does not mean diagonal folds. The diagonal line on your ruler is what I meant. So you've got these little corners, and you've got this diagonal line on your ruler, and you can kind of eyeball using this diagonal line. So this one happens to hit right on the line. This one's a little off, but I'm happy with how centered this square is. So I'm going to trim that off. So a lot of these clear acrylic rulers will have a 45 degree line. And you can eyeball how that hits your corners. If I turned it this way, I can put that diagonal line on my corners and see how well they do or don't hit. This one hits pretty good. That one's a little off, but I'm happy with it. So that is why that last bullet confused me, because I put the wrong word in there. Diagonal lines on your ruler is what we're talking about. All right. So this was a quick class today. These blocks, I mean, some of you are already making them. Some of you are um, starting earlier in the process. You're more on time with what the class is doing. We're going to sew 12 of these traditional light and dark blocks. So you have your center. You have your lights group and your darks group, or whatever your two groups are. Then, whatever color is your background, you're going to sew four more blocks exactly the same way. But if my background were these um, kind of gross beigey colors, <laughs> these colors are probably beautiful in a different quilt. They're just not too attractive with this orange. Um, so let's say this beigey color was my background color. I'm going to sew four blocks. And the whole lap all the way around is whatever is my background color. So if you have a light background, around your center, you're going to go light, 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 light. So the only thing different from the other blocks, instead of going dark, dark, light, light, it's just light, 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 light. If your background is dark, it's going to be dark, 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 dark. So maybe what I need to say is it's going to be background, 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 all the way around, all your laps. So the only thing that's different is that accent color. Just background has too many syllables. The total is 16 blocks. Then you'll have enough blocks. When you get all the way to the end, you can check and trim all your blocks to match that smallest block. And I encourage everyone to join the Facebook group. That's where you can post your success stories. You can ask questions. You can um, share what's going on. You can say, I don't know, what do you think about this? Um, you can always reach out to me by my email address, which is there. Most of you know my phone number. I can give you that. So reach out, and I will give you some help. Reach out to your classmates, and they can give you some help. You've got some really experienced sewists in this group. Um, and that's that. So I'll just warn you, in my slides, I did write light, 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 light. That should be background. Whatever color is your background. In my example on the slides, the background was light. So I take that with a grain of salt. And really, that's it for our class today. Um, is anyone desperately confused? Have I lost anyone completely? Is anyone like, I don't want to do this? <laughs> I hope not. I hope you're still excited about making your quilt. I just sewed an entire strip with an empty bobbin. Uh, um, is that the question? You want to know how to fill your bobbin? Was that you, Christine? It was me. I was just I, I pulled a U and I just sewed like twelve inches without uh, any thread on my bobbin. So null and void. Yeah. Okay. So that's that's called doing a Jacqueline when you sew and sew and sew and sew and you're like, what is wrong? and you didn't have any thread in your bobbin, and you just did like the best piecing of your life for 10 minutes, and there was no thread. <laughs> so yeah, post on the group if you do a Jacqueline. <laughs> and you sew with no thread. And how far did you go before you realized you didn't have thread? You can run on a thread in the top. That's the bad one, because you're looking right at it. If you don't see that you don't have thread in your top, that's really embarrassing, and I did that. The bobbin thread you don't see, so at least you have an excuse. <laughs> Because you don't see it. But I sewed, I had to be 30 inches with no top thread. It makes you feel like a genius, I'll tell you that. You feel really good about yourself. <laughs> All right. 
So there's your log cabin, block construction. Several of the people in the class um, went ahead, so um, it should be fairly easy to figure out because they figured it out. It's a great block. You'll do 12 with the half and half, two of the star color, two of the background color, around and around. You'll do four more for a total of 16 of all background color. And you'll have a pretty accent color. I have this, like, I have, like, plain and plainer on mine. This is just whatever scraps I grabbed, and I didn't care about them because this is just to demonstrate. All right, um, short class today, quick hour, including demonstration, including meet and greet from the folks at Transmission. <laughs> and that's all I've got. If you um, get lost in your homework, reach out. Reach out on the Facebook group. So you go to the Facebook page, which is facebook.com slash longarming by Jacqueline. You go to groups, and there's the LBJ, which is longarming by Jacqueline, beginner quilting bee. And that is the group for this. And that is a great place to ask questions because somebody's going to be on Facebook and see you asking for help. Or you can brag book. Or you can say, I don't know, what do you think of these colors? And they'll be like, it looks like a weird 70s kitchen, Jacqueline. Why did you pick orange and beige? <laughs> or whatever. They'll say something constructive and positive to you. And we'll do it together. All right. If there's no other questions, then you know what to do. Get yourself so in. And let's see what's on next week's agenda. You'll come back with your blocks. And next week we'll talk about assembling the top. So happy sewing. Enjoy yourself. I'll see you in a week. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Have a good Have day, awesome. everybody. Come wave. Bye. There you go. Bye, Abigail. <laughs> Thank you. So, say bye, Aunt Nicole. Bye, Aunt Nicole. <laughs> bye, baby. <laughs> and Grandma. And bye, Grandma. Uh -oh. <laughs> right, I'm, hang I'm hanging up now. Bye. <laughs>